Hey everybody, happy Sunday. Thank you all for being here. As usual, it's the weekend live Q&A. We're going to go through all the top thoughts from the week, the Q&A. We're going to go through all the and top C what else we can uncover? I've got some interesting ones today. Uh, first of all, lots of thought-provoking news analysis. I'm going to dig into short squeezes. I'm going to simply portray how the MicroStrategy Gambit works and why I believe in it. We'll look at a little bit of pairs, Bitcoin MicroStrategy, MicroStrategy Bitcoin, etc. Uh, we'll talk about how to store your seed phrase safely, why governments can't stop printing money, and so much more. <laughs> It, there's a lot in here. As usual, they get bigger and longer. So let's just jump in. Of course, none of this is ever financial advice. It's only edutainment. So the very first question is from Sproggy. How would your allocations change if you only had 60000 to invest? For small players with don't invest more than you can afford to lose in mind, how do we play this to maximize the square footage of our eventual Bora Bora Villas? Spro <laughs> good question, Sproggy. Very funny, uh, but very good. So this... This one I thought a lot about because it is tricky. Now, before I jump in as to what I did, because I can't tell you what to do, I can just say what I did, is, again, everything is from my perspective. So first of all, the longer the time frame, the more risk you can assume. What I mean by that is, if you've got to wait for Bitcoin to perform over the next 12 weeks versus the next five years, the five-year bet is way, way safer than the next 12-week bet, okay? Second thing, the higher the level of assets you have, the more diversification you can afford. For example, real estate, equities, crypto. Uh, sometimes if you don't have many assets, you can't really disperse them as widely. And third, the less you have, the more you have to worry about blowing up your bag. Now, what I mean by that, if you only have 60K, you put it all on one horse and that horse you know, blows up, you're in big trouble. So these are things to really think about and keep in mind. So my strategy, <coughs> excuse me, back in the 90s was to find a rhythm, find something I could do really well, and then wash, rinse, and repeat. So my goal, very simple, back in the 90s was to find a way of generating 30% returns per year after taxes. Really simple, not too aggressive. I wasn't looking to double my money every year, just 30% because I had a 10-year plan. And remember, always have a plan. Uh, covered call was my strategy in the 90s. And whenever I made profits, I'd buy real estate. Real simple. So why 30%? Where did that come from? So I knew about compounding and the importance of compounding. And I thought, well, with 30%, and this is what 30% per annum does to 60,000. Of course, there'll be fluctuations along the way. But basically, in 10 years, you can turn 60K into a million dollars with just 60,000 of initial capital at 30% annual gains. And that was very, very important. The other thing I did was I knew how critical it was to find disruption. And then I was obsessed with finding disruption. I was in Silicon Valley. I was surrounded by all of this new <laughs> dot com stuff. And I was obsessed. So I spent a lot of time sniffing out the winners. And this is why that's important too. So forget 30%. Look at what these puppies did over the past 10 years. And this is from Watch Your Guru. So you can see here, over the last 10 years, Bitcoin, 210,000%. Tesla, 15,000%. NVIDIA, 5,000%. Netflix, 3,000%. Amazon, 1,200%. Microsoft, 944%. Apple, 743%. Google, 718%. S&P, 500 304%. And gold, 7%. Now, what else it did was, I have owned, basically because I spent an inordinate amount of time identifying these assets, I've owned them all, but then I have my tap dancing shoes on and when they start to slow down, I bounce them. So for example, I've owned Apple in the past, I owned Microsoft in the past, I owned Netflix in the past, but not anymore. Will I ever return to them? Probably not, don't think so. But I still own Bitcoin, Tesla. In fact, those two are my two biggest positions. See any pattern here, anybody? Uh, I own NVIDIA, I own Amazon, and I own Google. I have never, ever owned an S&P 500 index, nor gold. Okay? So <laughs> the big message there is do your homework. Identify the winning assets. Get in early. Develop a strategy. Wash, rinse, repeat. Take your profits. Invest them in something hard like real estate. So 60K, I started with, I came to this country with a bicycle and a suitcase in the mid-90s. Okay? Nothing else. Nothing else. 
It took me a while to make up my first 20 grand. Then I started investing. So here we are. Anyway, that's me. So next question is from Bugul. With approximately 20% of Tesla's revenue coming from China and a major crisis looming there, what do you think the impact of this will be on Tesla if the Chinese economy were to crumble down? Bugul, so this is interesting. And we all know that the C-19 restrictions in China had a huge impact on, I think it was April, May, part of June, um, numbers produced out of uh, the Gigafactory over there, and that hobbled Tesla's output. But let's dig into what it means. So the numbers for China, real quick, and don't quote me on these, but they are more or less correct, but maybe a month old, two, two months old. So China, June total sales were 78,906 cars. It was up 137% year over year, which is good. China EV sales are 27% of all cars because they've got a lot of domestic incentives to incentivize people to buy electric cars. And China wants to be the leader in EV manufacturing going forward. And there's like 10 solid EV makers up there. Nothing like Tesla, but they're, you know, they are generating EVs and creating them very fast. Now, they all said very few to export in June, which means the Asian markets are way, way behind in backlogs. And Tesla can sell every car that they make. Not a problem. The other thing to consider is as well, the Chinese middle class is very affluent despite downturn and they will continue to buy. So I don't think no matter how bad the China situation happens, there'll always be money. There'll always be people that will buy these cars. Now let's talk about uh, some of the EV share, which might be a little point of concern. It doesn't really tie directly to your question, but it does show uh, this has been floating around and it has spooked some people thinking, oh my God, Tesla's not winning the game. But basically what this shows here is Tesla is losing EV share, but they are conflating supply and demand. In second quarter, Tesla lost 70,000 units because Shanghai was shut down due to C19 like we just covered. So add 70K back to Tesla Q2 deliveries of 254 and add back 70K to EV industry sales of 1544 cars, um, 1,000 cars. You can see the Tesla Q2 2Q EV share was about 20%, maybe 21%. And that as per Gary Black as well, a lot of information. So there was a disruption. It did have an impact, but let's just change the question a little bit. Should we be concerned? So first of all, we know we have Berlin coming online and ramping up real fast. We also have Austin, Texas, Gigafactories. And just to show you how backlogged we are. I just went to the Tesla website today. This is just in the US alone. So the Model Y estimated delivery is somewhere, say, January to April 2023. And the Model X is March 2023 out to June 2023. Remember, Model X is a super luxury vehicle. They're incentivized to sell the most expensive models first. And you have to wait a very long time for a new Model X. And you can't even buy the basic one anyway. <laughs> So uh, they sell the, the plaids and all that first. So again, on top of all this, there are no long range Model 3s until 2023. And there's over a million pre-orders for Cybertruck. So I'm not worried at all about demand. Now, this is very telling. This is something that came out this week. It's California leads the way in trends for the United States and many other parts of the world. And Tesla Model 3 and Y are the best selling vehicles in California. Okay, the number one and number two. California is the seventh biggest economy in the world. And this is what the people there are buying. Now let's look at what these cars are doing to other brands that are in their peer group. So you've got the Model Y, which is kind of luxury compact SUV area up against the GLC, class Mercedes, BMW X3, Audi Q5, Lexus NX. They aren't even in the same ballpark. <laughs> it's over half of all this category of cars is the Model Y. And then the Model 3, same thing. 61% of the cars crushing Lexus ES, BMW 3 Series, BMW 4 Series, Lexus IS. So this is a very foreboding <laughs> set of data if you are BMW, Audi, etc., Mercedes. Very, very scary. And again, what California does and trends, the rest of the country will follow and other countries around that too. So from that perspective, not concerned at all about China, even if the China market would disappear, there is more than enough demand. So, and also, even if the gigafactory in China were to implode, 
there's two more coming online real fast and ramping up. Well, they're already online, but they're ramping up real fast. So hope that allays any fears. Uh, next question is from Sheldon's Bitcoin Journey. Please update us about MicroStrategy Short Squeeze. I thought it was going to dip back down quickly, but it just keeps coming up. So there were two very clear short squeezes that I published. Uh, you guys may remember one of these uh, tweets. <laughs> some people saw this on a Sunday, I think it was, and they made some money in pre-market in the Netherlands trading uh, proxies of MicroStrategy. But uh, again, it was very heavily shorted stock, still is, and we'll talk more about some identification of short targets. But let's look at some charts to really understand where we are going. So what I've put together is a couple of pair charts and inverted them and show you what I see. And this is very important. And some people really struggle to wrap their heads around pairs. So I'm going to spell it all out real simply as to where we are. So first of all, this is the MicroStrategy Bitcoin pair. It is basically the MicroStrategy share price divided by the Bitcoin price. So in this case, it's about, say, $350 divided by... $24,300, and that gives us your, your score. Now, uh, in this chart, I have the red box on the bottom left. That's when MicroStrategy started buying Bitcoin. It was August 11th, 2020. And since then, the pair is up 31%. But note, when you look at this pair, we had a huge spike uh, back in early 2021, I think it was Feb 2021. And MicroStrategy went to $1,200, from what I recall. But that ran ahead of the actual Bitcoin price, which didn't spike till April. So it's super interesting to look at. Also on the chart here, you've got the 200-day and the 50-day moving average. 50-day is red, 200-day is blue. And you can see we've just formed a golden cross. Okay, so who knows what happens when we see a golden cross? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, well, typically it's an increase in the price of the pair. And of course the stock. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Second, I'm going to compare that pair, MicroStrategy Bitcoin, compared to Bitcoin itself. And here you see a much clearer picture of the evolution of this pair compared to Bitcoin. Sometimes the front runs Bitcoin uh, price, for example, the spike in the pair versus the spike in Bitcoin that didn't happen until two months later. So it's an interesting thing to think about and trade sometimes as well. And uh, notice as well, it did not really come alive in November 2021 because maybe other issues were at play. So let's look at the reverse of that. This is the Bitcoin MicroStrategy pair and the correlation coefficient with the 200-week moving average. Okay, so the 200-week is that kind of tealy, bluey line at the bottom. And you can see that this pair is just hovering around that 200-week moving average. You can also see that the, the, you know, approximately according to this, there's about 69.5 shares of MicroStrategy per Bitcoin. Remember, this is Bitcoin price divided by MicroStrategy price. And you can see how the correlation is out of whack almost half of the time. So there are lots of trading options here, but just get familiar with how these things work. Look at all these different pairs and inversions and you can find good trading opportunities. Now, is there going to be another short squeeze? No, I uh, personally think the fair price of MicroStrategy, according to my math, about $388 today, but this is what it all boils down to. And this is what people and Wall Street can't figure out. They get bogged down with gap impairment charges and everything else. But I tried to simplify it and why I believe MicroStrategy is an interesting play. So yes, they did borrow 2.4 billion in Bitcoin. Much of that is at 0% interest. If you can believe that or not, it's crazy. So imagine a scenario where Bitcoin goes to 250K over the next five years. I absolutely believe that's very, very possible, very bear casey. That's a 10x from where we are now over the next five years. Again, bear case. Now, if that does happen, all MicroStrategy needs to do is sell 9,000 Bitcoin to repay that 2.4 billion in debt. And they still have 120,000 Bitcoin left and a bag value of 32 billion dollars. Okay, that's the gambit. Okay. And this is why it's exciting. And I'm excited to see what the next five years bring. So anybody wants to play that now, if, of course, I, I calculate the number of right, forgot to write it down. If Bitcoin does go to 250,000, can't remember the price of uh, 
I can pull it up. Let me. I'll pull it up during the Q and A. If anybody's interested in asking, I can pull up that price because I have the calculation done. I just forgot to add it here on the sheet. Anyway, I don't want to give you the wrong number, so I'll wait for that. So that's kind of the situation. No more short squeeze, but there is extreme volatility between these pairs. Watch them carefully, study them carefully, and start thinking about Bitcoin as a denominator for everything, not the dollar. And remember, everything is a pair. Okay, MicroStrategy at three hundred fifty bucks is paired with the U.S. dollar. Okay. Let's go to the next question from Cryptathon. Is there any good typical play on holders should trade a short squeeze? So we write these questions down directly. So first of all, to identify short squeeze plays, I always track the amount of the shares that are actually traded short. So in this chart, it is the short hit list as I call it, and it has the percentage of the actual stock shorted. So one number top of the list right now is Inhabit. I never even heard of that company before, but they're 56.52% shorted. Okay, that's a prime target. Then you got your Bed Bath & Beyond. Some people call it a meme stock like GameStop and AMC. You got your WeWorks, which were <laughs> funded by places like Japan, Japan SoftBank, which I covered yesterday. Upstart Holdings, Beyond Meat, Groupon, Fisker, an EV company. You've got Marathon Digital Holdings. That's the one actually I say that has, is going to have some maybe some balance sheet problems going forward. Um, Lemonade, some online insurance company. Nikola, another EV maker, etc. Carvana, a car seller. So this is how you identify the targets and watch for them to spike. And then you know right before they spike. Uh, that's an opportunity. So this is uh, the way I typically play short squeezes or gamma squeezes, but I wait for the top to see when the squeeze runs out of steam. And you can figure that out pretty easily using a whole bunch of different TA tools and looking at volume, et cetera, et cetera. Now I identify the optimal call to sell based on Black Scholes model. And I find the most expensive out of the money option and make sure it's out of the money. And finally, I also make sure I have enough time for the stock to mean revert. I don't want to be caught out. And that's very important. So uh, back earlier in the day, I was doing some of this with some callers and stuff with, I think it was GameStop. Uh, but make sure you have enough time. Make sure you have enough capital in case it does continue to ride up that you can ride it out because it'll eventually always mean revert. And sometimes it may take two or three months for that to happen. So be prepared for that. And that's how I play it. So I hope that helps. Next question is from FKA Zeroth. Given that every chain paying attention knows we make data-driven decisions. Uh, first of all, not everybody makes data-driven decisions. In fact, most people make decisions based on thumbnails on Twitter, but that's a separate issue. But how hard would it be for Solana maxis to manipulate the KPIs we use to inflate the resilience of Solana? So this is a really, really good question and a deep question. And I want to thank Laura Shin for her great book, which goes into this as well. This is the crypt Cryptopians, Idealism, Greed, Lies, and the Making of the First Big Cryptocurrency Craze by Laura Shin. So basically, fake data is always a concern when analyzing anything out there, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. It's important to make sure the data sources that you have are reliable. So for example, we get government data on inflation. It's BS. <laughs> we, 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 we get told things by political leaders is BS. So you make sure you peel back the onion, like the jobs report last week. Very important to look at that. And that is why you always have to rigorously analyze the data and the sources as we go forward. Don't just blindly trust the data. Now, in crypto, we've seen many cases of crypto founders making false claims about their chains, faking exchange volume, or inflating the activity on their chain, or even their own education credentials. This, all this stuff happens, so it's very, very important to look at the team. And Laura Shin, uh, her book covers a lot of these items, so it's well, well worth a read. And, But in answer to your question regarding Solana, is it possible to spot fake data? Well, fake data in crypto creates trust issues among users, exchanges, investors, and financial institutions and regulators. Hence, there are a lot of parties that have a stake in rooting out the fake data and exposing it. And the good news is blockchains are public ledgers. 
that anyone can verify. And this makes it easy, relatively easy in some cases, to perform blockchain analysis to determine outliers and fake data. For example, if you want to find out if there is fake inflated trade volumes, we can compare the amounts of cryptocurrency that enter via exchanges and on-chain transactions to the off-chain trade volumes. And this allows us to spot right away the difference between organic trading activity and instances of probable inflation. And with all these groups looking at this data and folks like analysts and Laura Shin, it really makes it hard for a large crypto, especially the likes of Solana, to fake these basic KPIs. But the key factor is, if you lie and you fake it, you destroy your credibility and you destroy the chain. So bear that in mind. So not too concerned about that one at all. So next question. From Alex K. This is a lovely question, and thank you, Alex, for it. Hypothetically, if the Fed stopped printing money and kept the money fixed, uh, supply fixed as it is now, wouldn't that solve inflation over time and fix the system? Ta da! The, the trillion, the multiple trillion dollar question. Technically, yes. And this was a cool piece uh, out of Canada. It's a couple of months old, but I, held, I kept this actual article. The Conservative Party, party leadership in Canada, hopeful Pierre Poilievier, I hope I got that right, Poilievre, or I can't remember what, what his name is, but recently asserted that the solution to inflation is to stop the central bank from printing money. But the problem is, how is the government going to stop government spending? That's the issue, okay? So putting Canada aside, let's look at the US. It's really easy to portray here. This is the debt clock, uh, and it just shows real simple. There's so many different points you could point to here, but the Fed can never stop printing because of the national debt. This is the US debt clock, as I mentioned, and you can see even now with this high inflation and a super low interest rate environment, the interest on the debt is nearly as high as the tax revenue. So the green arrow at the top is the tax revenue, 4.3 trillion, and the interest is 3.4 trillion. So they they nearly match, okay? And this is a huge part of my whole thesis that the Fed is boxed in. They can't go beyond 3.5% Fed funds rate. If they do, they completely screw this pooch. Nobody talks about this, nobody sees it. But in my mind, if they do, they crush this, they explode the deficit and kill GDP. It just seems straightforward to me. Anyway, if the Fed stops money printing, the US would immediately become insolvent to go bankrupt. Our debt system is dependent on money printing and the money printing is what's killing us at the same time. <laughs> it's circular and you know, that's where we are. So that's why people believe there will be a great reset down the line. Five, 10 years, 15 years from now, it's probably going to happen. So the deflationary death spiral is another interesting angle. The other side of the coin, excuse the pun. So what this, this causes economists to theorize what would be a deflationary death spi spiral. And this is when there is a contraction in the economy due to rising cause of servicing cost of servicing debt. And this would lead to a collapse of the aggregate demand and a drop in spending so severe that producers would have to cut prices on an ongoing basis to find buyers. That's the deflation. And this would cause recession, mass unemployment, and an implosion of the financial system and crush GDP growth, complete Armageddon, as I always talk about as well. For example, suppose stopping the money printer causes deflation of 10% per year. If the government borrows money at the nominal interest rate of 0%, it actually faces 10% real cost of borrowing. That means every year that passes, the debt gets compounded by 10%. Very quickly, everything goes down the toilet. That's where we are. <laughs> it's that simple. So theoretically, the answer to your question is yes, but they're stuck. They're boxed in. So great question. Next question is from Crocs Moon. Can you comment on the composition of SoFi's latest Web3 and energy ETFs? Are they good investments? So Crocs Moon, you obviously don't know me. I don't like ETFs or funds in general. I think they're crap. And remember the, uh, I'll explain why in a second. But first of all, the SoFi uh, T-Web, which is the Web3 um, holdings, seem to be classified because nothing is on the website that we could find. 
they say it will look at the decentralized internet space, NFTs, tokenization, metaverse, big data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we don't know what they are holding. We don't know what they're going to buy, and this is very unsettling. So they're kind of selling something without saying what's in it. And the top 10 holdings, the whole section is blank. So again, I don't like ETFs. Um, I don't like buying a bag of mixed garbage because the return is kind of normally bad. Plus the Web3 space is so, so young and untested. These guys will probably pick the wrong assets anyway. So let's look at the energy token here. This isn't very appealing to me either. It's basically their ESG offering. Looks, looking at the top 10 holdings, it's a hodgepodge of different renewable energy companies, uh, about 3% to different companies in the space. And if you're going to invest in the space, just take the time. Do your own research. Identify the best. I did that uh, in early 2020. I found a company called Nextera Energy. That was the best two or three years ago. Uh, for this type of hedge to your portfolio of this renewable energy play. But right now, again, it's a shotgun approach. There might be a couple of winners in there, but I guarantee you there's a couple of losers. At the end of the day, your return is zero. And remember, this is what I want everybody to take away today. Remember, I covered this, I think, a week or two ago. I don't remember when, but I analyzed the performance of the last 10 years of the S&P 500. So here, this is just over the last five years, the last... 10 years is 50% of the term, but just the last five years, five stocks, 1% of the S&P 500 drove 40% of the returns. So to some people that might, might not make any sense. It's like, huh? 1%, 5%, 500, what is that? So top five companies, imagine the whole S&P 500 makes a, a million dollars in returns. The average return per company is 2000 bucks. The top five make 80,000 each. The bottom 495 make 1,200 each. So the bottom 495 underperform the average return because the top five companies are the black holes that suck everything in. This is why I spend so much time identifying winners. Absolutely biggest job I do is analyzing, studying, getting into winners early and getting in hard because a little reminder, <laughs> Let me pull this chart up again, because I want this to be scarred in your minds. This is why, okay? Disruption pays big. Getting in early pays big, okay? So that's the, the big takeaway today. So hopefully you guys, I didn't hammer that home too hard. Okay, next question is from Florian. What impact will the launch of BlackRock's private Bitcoin trust have on Bitcoin? So we had a couple of questions on BlackRock. I did cover it twice in two videos, one this week and one last week. So it's extremely important and by far the biggest news for Bitcoin of 2022. So the impact. So well, check out my models as well. I'll post those two videos up in this video too. But partnering with Coinbase to offer access to crypto and custody for institutional investors, really, really bullish news, no doubt about that. BlackRock's entry legitimizes the space in the eyes of institutions and regulators. It's a huge rubber stamp. And this is a huge ESG firm, speaking of energy before. <clears throat> BlackRock also has 10 trillion under, mass, under management. So these are the deepest pockets you can get on planet Earth. And BlackRock is also very well respected. In fact, I saw a call record where I think it was Jerome Powell had his list of his calls from his office. Uh, the top 10 calls, he called Larry Fink three times, which is like three times more than any of his own staff members. That shows you the connection between the government and Larry Fink, the head of BlackRock. Who works for who? My money is, you know, the government works for Larry Fink because he's that big and that powerful. Anyway, also, you've got other uh, players coming in. You've got Fidelity, JP Morgan, Charles Schwab, Credit Suisse. They're all building their, their crypto divisions. Uh, they're all staffing up. They're all making offerings to institutions and accredited investors. And that is when I talk about the smart money. The smart money gets it. The smart mon money wants to allocate to it hard, and they will. And this is what I've been talking about all year. I missed it by about a quarter. But here we are. It's happening. And uh, the BlackRock will push for a Bitcoin spot ETF. And like I mentioned before, who has more power? Sun and shine from Grayscale 
or Larry Fink from BlackRock to get an approval. Checkmate. Okay, next uh, question is Left Hand Screwdriver. That's a cool name. Now that BlackRock is offering exposure to US clients only, what is the likelihood that similar institutions in other countries will follow suit? Game theory? Well, game theory is definitely on. But first of all, a couple of little corrections. Uh, it is for institutional clients, not US clients. And those institutional clients can be global, and they are global. That allow, that 10 trillion comes from all over the world. Sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, etc. But remember, there's only one BlackRock. But yes, the game theory is in full effect. As you mentioned, the Fidelities, Morgan Stanley, Schwab's, etc. <clears throat> but also, you have other countries that were quick to jump on things like Bitcoin spot ETFs up in Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, they are already in play. So the game theory is happening. And it's the timing actually of BlackRock's entry into this market is quite impeccable because they're coming in at the bottom. And that's when everybody is eager to buy. They just need the infrastructure and the rubber stamping to be able to allocate towards it. So next question is from Tiberius. How should I safely store my cold wallets and seed phrases? Uh, wallets in home safe and seed engraved in stainless steel at a safe deposit box. So this is a really good question. So again, we're going to do uh, some unboxing videos this week on how to do things like set up your ledger, your trezor, etc. Uh, blow by blow, and also how you can stake on these assets. So stay tuned for that if you're interested. Uh, many have asked for it. So cold storage. So first of all, uh, safe deposit box, yes. Fireproof safe at home, yes. And some people believe they can hide uh, <laughs> their cold storage wallets in a book that's cut out because people don't look inside books anymore. But no, that's not fireproof. So that's a bit of a joke, but some people actually do do that, believe it or not. So principles of good seed storage. Remember this, everybody. This is so important. Take a screenshot of this and just print it out and store it somewhere. So storing your recovery seed should be something that is personal to you. Don't share how you store your seed with somebody else. Here are some principles to follow. Um, first of all, make sure your recovery is protected against natural disaster. Um, you can use cold steel or crypto steel. These are indestructible plates that protect against fires and natural disasters. And second, keep your recovery seed out of sight. That means don't just put it in a safe out in the open where somebody can find it. And also, you can also store more than one copy of your recovery seed if one is destroyed. Make sure you have others and consider your loved ones and dependents and include access to your recovery seed in your will. Very important. And keep a private record of where you put it. The last thing you want to do is forget. And has anybody ever lost anything? There you go. That's the importance of that. So the big do do not do's of seed storage. Uh, don't rely on your memory. Like some people say, oh, I store my seed phrase in a song, etc. Story, memory devices. Don't do that. Uh, don't take a picture of it. Don't ever send it digitally, like email, text, Snapchat, etc. Uh, don't use a password manager for it. Don't put it in the cloud. Don't put it on one of those things where you can hide photos in your phone, in a special vault. Don't do it. Okay. And some other ideas, uh, obviously have a safe, make sure it's fireproof, uh, have a safe deposit box at a bank. And every, every home has some fairly safe hiding spots. But remember where you hid things. Sometimes people hide things in the home and forget where they put them. So remember, have a plan and uh, hammer a metal plate and bury it. I know some people do that. Some people even bury two metal plates. But remember, never ever store your recovery seed phrase online. So with that favorite time of the week are your, your donations and super chats and stickers help support Animals Asia uh, to end the bile bear trade, which is a horrific thing if you dig into it. And a big shout out to the Patreon member and veterinarian Lori for your massively big heart and for this idea and all you do for animal friends. So appreciate that. So now we're going to go to some questions and Okay, let me pull it up. Boo! Live Q&A and a big thank you as well to the mods in the chat and everybody out there. So first question is from one Brydom. Do you think we're ever going to re revisit Bitcoin and Sol lows from this year uh, or next? Everything looks bullish, but so many still pessimistic. I 
this is, is this is I think about this every single day for the last six weeks. I look at the extremely negative sentiment out there. Eighty percent of FinTwit, which are not uh, financial twits, that's financial Twitter. I think that's what FinTwit stands for. And YouTube, just look at the thumbnails. There is an incredibly high bearish sentiment out there, and the majority. 60 to 80 percent are convinced we're going to 12,000. And I think that just stems from a few people that have been saying that story. Um, so we'll see. I believe <laughs> I'm, I'm on the opposite side because I watch the institutional money flows and other types of metrics. Uh, I watch what the smartest capital allocators in the world are doing and how they see things. So I think we're beyond the lows, the bottoms are put in. I took a snapshot of all my thumbnails over the last six weeks and you could look at them and you can see kind of my uh, point of view. Again, nobody's ever perfect. Nobody's right all the time. But all of the stuff that I look at tells me we're not going to revisit the lows. And I am 80% certain of that. Not 100%, maybe 80 to 90%, but I don't think we're going down. Now, that's Bitcoin. Solana is a different kettle of fish, a lot more risk, a lot more volatility. But when I compare Solana to Ethereum, um, it should be a lot higher technically uh, from a relative value basis. And again, we just look at data here. We look at quant, we look at metrics and we measure everything. That's how we make decisions. Nothing about sentiment or how people feel or what type of religion or tribe they belong to. We just look at data. So from that perspective, one Brightum, no, I think we saw the bottom. <laughs> Plus, you know, the other way to think about it too is like many names, what, what, Ethereum is up over 100% from the bottom, 75% in the last 30 days. For us to go back means entering a whole new uh, kind of bear market reversion. So things would have to lose more than 50% to get back to the bottoms anyway, which I think is it's a far way back, put it that way, simply put. So let me see. Uh, say CD, in your opinion, are we still in a bear market? So this is, everything is, people say everything's always the same, but no, I think everything's different this time. We have a chronic macroeconomic backdrop. We have war in Ukraine. We have um, lack of stability between kind of China and Taiwan, and we have elections coming up, and we have the Fed and everything else. But I just look at money and money flows. There's three trillion on the sidelines. A lot of people allocated and jumped in. There's a lot of money that is sitting there with one Brightum's question: Are we going to go back to the lows? And the longer we stay up, and the more we go up, the higher the probability that people realize we're not going to go back, and then they start deploying capital. So you have your Harry Dents who think the markets will fall by ninety percent, and the guy. Kawasaki and all those fellows, but I don't subscribe to their opinions at all. I think we are out of the bear market. And if you measure the bear market, so the bear market typically for crypto is a 40% downturn, how I measure it, stock markets 20%. We're, we're way beyond 40% off the bottoms uh, for most of crypto. And even in the stock market from the bottom to the all time high, we are right in the middle. We're right in the midway range. So from that perspective, I think we're out of it. Also, a lot of other people are saying kind of crypto winter is behind us. Now, it doesn't mean it's gangbusters, bull market, straight back to all time highs. No, we have some choppiness. We have to wait for that last big cloud to clear. And that is the Fed pivot. Once that happens, straight up. Trust no one. Uh, do you think swapping Mike strategy for GBTC is a good move? Yes, <laughs> not financial advice, of course, but I'm losing faith in Grayscale. And I always said MicroStrategy is a better ETF. They have financial jujitsu. Now you have Michael Saylor. His only, only focus right now is to um, find a way to accumulate more Bitcoin. And I can't remember what he said. He said in an interview with Daniel Cambone, it was, I'd rather have a volatile ride and win, then slowly lose or slowly die. Words to that effect. Don't quote me correctly, but I thought it was brilliant. Uh, high volatility means high alpha, high return. There's no, you don't make a lot of return if it's a smooth sailing trip, okay? It's like sailing across the Atlantic. 
the windier, the stormier, the bigger the waves, the rougher the ride, the faster you go. So, <laughs> so trust no one, not financial advice, but I do think um, definitely, uh, even with the huge discount of 31% last time I checked for GBTC, I think long-term, you know, even going back to my numbers that I shared before, 2.4 trillion and 2.4 billion in debt. If my bear case scenario fulfills its prophecy in the next five years, quarter million dollar Bitcoin, that means they can pay off all their debt with just 9,000 Bitcoin and still have 120,000 plus left. So that's the gambit that I am thinking about. And of course, you don't use 2% management fee per year with MicroStrategy, which adds up over time, everybody. Um, let me see. SJ uh, from Canada. I love the, the federal pivot drinking. Uh, that's James. Yeah. I, I Again, I just look at the numbers. Um, mathematically, they have too much debt to increase their own debt servicing costs. There's not enough income. If they do increase the debt, they increase the deficit and smash GDP. Real simple. Uh, Tom Jackson, thoughts on helium mining. We looked at HNT and helium mining, and I think at the time, it was the second best mining opportunity people had right now. And it may become more popular, but uh, I just think the some of the fundamentals of how it, the whole thing is structured, it's really hard to make it work. Now, if you are in a, or maybe you're not talking about mining, maybe you're talking about the token itself, then you have a quick look at the tokenomics. Uh, I, I always get asked about helium, I think. Oh, helium mining. Um, but let me pull this up. Agency. I can't remember where it is. I haven't looked at it in a long time. I don't even know where it is. Um, tokenomics is average. The, ooh, yeah, no, <laughs> I wouldn't mess with it at all. Um, it's still up there in the ranking, but the performance doesn't look good. Uh, whether you look at any chart, 90 day, three months, one month, very low volume. No, nope, I would skip. But again, I'm ultra conservative when it comes to different types of tokens. So Tom, skip that. And Frank Inglis, uh, might the Rhine dry up impact on Tesla distribution? So I guess you're talking about the Rhine River in Germany. Uh, I was not aware it could dry up. I'm more concerned about the energy in Germany for that factory. It is a very intensive factory, but of course, the Germans are world-class engineers. They'll figure out how to generate energy. And they're all working, we're already working on some things up in uh, Libya, I think, for procurement of gas. So Frank, I am not too concerned about that. And uh, Dog One, keep stacking for the animals. Happy Sunday all. Thank you so much too. And thank you for your super sticker as well. St. Jude needs us. Thanks, Mike, MT, Green Candle, and Gooby. Appreciate you all. Thank you all for being here and spending the Sunday. I don't know if there's any other questions or comments from the audience, but uh, it's the weekend. Maybe one more. That's it. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you all. We have, let me see, nearly 3,000 people watching live. Happy Sunday, everybody. Hope you guys all learned something from this. And again, remember, the future is very, very bright. You just need to get through these this little bumpy patch, and we are on the way out of the storm. Running queue. I said, oh, I said September for sure. We'd probably be out of it. And it looks like we're coming out of it even faster than that. So thanks all. Happy weekend.